Hi, welcome to our Worldview program. Institutions are essential for viable world order. They play a key role in sustaining the economy, shaping shared security and common action to overcome the planetary crises. Moreover, stable institutions with reliable processes shape critical ecosystems for reducing uncertainties, coordinate sharing of resources, and influencing societal attitudes and motivations for peaceful development. Global evidence shows that good institutions matter. They determine the level of development and growth in nations. Let us now take a look at some of those evidence. Building trust and international cooperation have never been more crucial. Global issues like climate change, rising inequality, armed conflicts, and global food security demand multilateral solutions. Intergovernmental institutions like the United Nations and the European Union are recognized as important platforms for fostering global collaboration and unity. A global survey conducted in 2020 by Pew Research Center across 14 countries found strong public support for international cooperation and multilateral governance with the need to work as a global community to solve problems. The results also supported the need for countries to consider the interest of other countries and make compromises on international issues. However, trust in international institutions has been under scrutiny. A separate survey conducted across 25 countries by the international research agency Glocalities in 2020 found that only half of the world population trusts the UN, which is highest compared to the trust that citizens have in the EU, NATO, government, or parliament in general. Surveys show that although the UN is seen as a promoter of human rights and peace, the confidence in the UN is drastically lower regarding dealing with international problems and caring about the needs of ordinary people. Trust and confidence in global institutions are foundational for delivering solutions to global challenges. Global institutions must step up to the challenge to re-spark confidence and inspire trust for collaborative solution building towards a better and more united world. From the climate crisis and the pandemic to the war in Ukraine, it is clear that institutions today are confronted by an era of great disruption and uncertainty. Faced with complex systemic issues, the current model of global two national institutions are being questioned. For one, President Zelensky of Ukraine has questioned the purpose and relevance of institutional models such as the United Nations and the European Union if they cannot act collectively for an immediate succession of hostilities. Many global and regional institutions emerged after the Second World War, and in the about time, they evolved. The question is not about when, but how. Many institutions have not changed their modes of decision-making, such as the outdated decision-making at the Security Council. When it comes to fighting climate crisis, how can nations be more effective in allocating resources to poorer countries without the means to do so? Individual institutions on their own are unable to address the scale of interconnected challenges we face today. This is the time to rethink together and do our part on how we can help enable better inter-institutional collaboration and shape more effective models today. In this worldview, my colleagues Rebecca and Yona will explore this topic about institutions with two global leaders. Steve Killia from Australia, who is the founder and executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace, and James C. Moore from the United States, who serves as founder and CEO of the Washington Institute for Business, Government and Society. We hope to contribute to the conversation of reimagining institutions to impact change. We will also share tools we have applied globally to help influence the United World. Over to the team. The world we live in today is extremely dynamic, with new challenges surfacing every day. These arising challenges are complex, many of which we have not faced before, resulting in great uncertainty. The COVID-19 pandemic, for example, it shook the world like an earthquake and demanded solutions to be delivered at unprecedented speed. It also called for holistic solutions that do not just protect human life, but also secure economic and social stability. The current Ukraine crisis has also appended the notion that peace and shared security, which was taken for granted, especially in Europe, is always a given. Our global institutions are responsible for enabling a fragile ecosystem, which success depends heavily on one core element, trust. Trust is crucial for maintaining social cohesion. 
and fundamental for society's acceptance and adoption of proposed solutions to society's biggest challenges. My colleague Rebecca had the opportunity to speak with two global leaders about institutions amid the various global challenges. We asked them about their perspectives on the current state of institutions and what can be done to enable institutions for a greater impact. First, let's hear from Steve Kilalea, who will give his thoughts about the ruptured world order. He will speak about how must institutions evolve to facilitate peace building. Steve Kilalea is the founder and executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace and creator of the Global Peace Index, the world's leading measure of global peacefulness and its economic value. The world today, it's suffering from many, many problems. There are also a lot of positives, but I think what I'll do at the moment is just focus on some of the negatives. And obviously, the first thing which comes to everyone's mind is the war in the Ukraine. And what we can see is that the Russians are suffering a large casualty to, to really move into the Ukraine. And what we can see, and this is a repeat of Afghanistan and a repeat of Iraq, is that where the population of a country doesn't wish to be invaded, it's very, very hard for an outside force, military force, to win over the longer run. Now, the Russians may be able to push through and capture Kiev. They may be able to install a puppet, puppet government. But the insurgency means that it will be impossible from to actually really be able to hold on to the territory. And this is a major change in warfare. So what happens now, as long as the resistance is willing to fight and it can be supplied with arms from an outside force, even the strongest military in the world can't win. If we shift to the Sahel in, some, in the northern end of sub-Saharan Africa, that's the epicentre now of global terrorism. Uh, in fact, 43% of all deaths in 2021 from terrorism is what's there. But the terrorism is an offshoot from a whole lot of systemic issues. And so what we find is that you've got a lot of the worst the ecological degradation in the world is there. You've got also that's very, very weak governments. There are 10 countries in the Sahel. There have been eight coup attempts, of which five have been successful in the last uh, 18 months. You've got uh, about 80% of the population suffering from food insecurity. You've got inadequate water. And on top of that, you've got population growth, which are going to be some of the largest in the world. So the population growth will be over 90% in the next 30 years. And so this is a systemic problem, bringing together a lot of the issues which we may see in the future. So it, it, it needs attention and urgent attention. So now, as we look at climate change, and we look at these ecological issues we've got today, climate change will just turbocharge them. We come back and we look at the economy. Inflation now is the highest it's been since the early 80s. Uh, and this is the sanctions bid on Russia. They doubled their interest rates from 10 to 20%. Turkey's inflation rate is now 52%. And the US posted its highest inflation rate uh, uh, at 7.9% since 1982. And now inflation will take a world which is really overloaded. So if you look at the developed world, those are the richest countries, if we look at total gross debt for government, private individuals and corporations, it's 245% of GDP. So as interest rates go up, all that debt becomes more expensive to service. And combined with that, we've got inequities within the economies. Now, if we come back and we look at the institutions, democracy has been declining over the last decade. We've seen the rise of very powerful authoritarian states. We also see the issues with authoritarian states. When you look at Russia and the invasion of the Ukraine, where leaders, when they've got total and absolute power, make unbalanced decisions. Because from where I'm standing now, uh, for President Putin, it's been a bad miscalculation invading the Ukraine. So he's obviously going to have suffer re heavy military losses. He wants to hold the territory or go on for years, and he's really united 
the EU towards NATO. So now, as we start to look at other issues with institutions as well, we can find that corruption here globally is generally on the rise, a bit least small, but it's generally on the rise. We find there's less trust in governments than what there has been. And we find that sort of inequities, group grievances, are also globally on the increase. And so these are some of the things we need to address. But what I want, to, want you to think about is you look at the challenges facing humanity today, they're global in nature, they're climate change, ever decreasing biodiversity, full use of the fresh water on the planet, and maybe underpinning all their overpopulation. And unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, cooperation or inclusiveness necessary to solve these problems. Therefore, I'd say peace is a prerequisite for the survival of the planet as we know it in the 21st century. But on top of that, also, what we find is the positive peace, the fact that it consists of eight different pillars, but these eight factors, if you like, not only do they create peace, they create a whole lot of other things which we think are important as well, such as higher per capita income, higher GDP growth, the better Countries which are high in positive peace are better uh, on ecological measures, got much better performance, better on measures of well-being and happiness, better on measures of development and inclusion as, the, as well. Therefore, positive peace in many ways can describe an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. Now, how does this operate? This all operates systemically. So we have these eight pillars, and you can't really pull them apart. They, they, they all come together because one reinforces another. So just to drive it home, because quite often when we're looking at problems, what we do is we're trying to find a problem. We try and look for the cause. Then when we find the cause, what we do is try and fix it and say, okay, great. But we can find as a testament to human development that doesn't really work. It's partially successful but it doesn't really work. So I'm just going to give you three of the pillars out of positive peace just to explain this clearly. We'll take one, which is well-functioning government, another one, which is low levels of corruption, and the third one, which is free flow of information, which in many ways could be epitomised by free press, but not necessarily so. So now, does government, with its laws and regulations, affect corruption? Or does corruption affect the way the government operates? Does a government affect what information flows through a society? Or does the information flow through the society affect how a government operates? Does corruption actually impinge on the, free, on, on the free flow of information? Or does the free flow of the information actually shape and control or engender corruption? So you can't separate any of it. It all goes together. Now, as you start to build this up more, it gets more and more complex. And so one of the things we do today, we're living inside systems. And we're all very aware, let's say, the climate system. We're also aware of the hemisphere we live on. And we now see ourselves as living in a contained environment. So these are systems, but we spend little time looking at our societies as systems. And this, I think, is one of the major changes we can take in terms of being able to better have governments which function a lot better. Start to look and study societies as societal systems and then look at mechanisms to be able to now work with them in a systemic way rather than in cause and effect or just finding, well, there's one problem, let's fix one cause keep bouncing around like that. Is there any way, um, do you think, that institutions today can reimagine themselves? I mean, you mentioned uh, how, you know, institutions today are changing. We're seeing a fall in democracy, a rise in the sort of a more authoritarian reign. Is there any way that you see institutions must reinvent themselves now or, or can reinvent themselves now um, to be able to really transform themselves and to meet the needs of the, this new world order that we're sort of experiencing today and to really start to begin to rebuild peace and trust? Certainly, seeing I'm on talking systems, I think the systems approach is the way, really is the way to go. 
and particularly now as we're seeing humanity uh, interface negatively with so many of our ecological systems. It, it, it's a, without, don't even have to go into the detail. It's just apparent to everyone these days. Now, mention the Sahil in the northern end of sub-Saharan Africa. There's 10 nations there. And so let's think about, let's say, uh, the UN. And the UN's a great organisation. Love it does a lot of really great work. So uh, this isn't really a criticism of the, the UN. It's rather more an example of how we got this mismatch. So let's look at the Sahel, okay? So you've got, to, uh, you've got Islamic terrorists. You've got countries with very, very weak governance. You've got a lack of business opportunity. You've got a lack of water, which then leads to a lack of food. You've got massive population growth. In fact, the country which has got the highest uh, populate, projected population growth in the next 30 years to 2050 is Niger at 161%. And so you've got, and you've got a lot of terrorism. So you've got all these factors coming together, conflict, terrorism, poor governance, a uh, lack of development, uh, overpopulation, and then stressing it all is climate change on top of it. So let's have a look at how the UN goes about uh, uh, tackling this. So first up, the UN has uh, uh, got uh, UNHCR, okay, so that's responsible for refugees because these conflicts create refugees. Then you've got UN peacekeepers, I think it's about 14,000 of them situated in the Sahel. You'll have the World Bank trying to work with the governments to improve the governance of it. Then you'll have the then you'll have UNDPN doing wash projects. You might have IMF coming in and trying to stimulate a, 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 a business in some shape, way, or form. Then you'll also have the the UN Population Fund, which may be doing family planning in there to try and help as well. And I could keep going with maybe six other institutions, but I won't. So now, if you think about it. And then you've got a whole lot of NGOs in there as well. So you think about the duplication of effort, okay? And they've all got a different lens, which is their own lens of expertise coming in. So, and we can see all the interventions aren't really working. So what's the solution? Solution is start by actually doing a really thorough systems analysis to understand the wants and needs and then what's the best entry points to try and change the system. And you don't necessarily do it on the Sahel, you could do it on a small geographic area, one which isn't too impacted by conflict to, to really work and work out your models on it. And then what you do based on the outcome of the systems analysis or the societal analysis, what you do then is you construct a new institution which should be built around the interventions you need to change the system. And so then you'd pull on resources out of all these other UN agencies I've mentioned to actually build the institution you need, which is specific to the uh, a, a systemic problem you're trying to solve. So and if you think about it, that's, that, that's a vastly different way of, the, uh, of going about thinking thinking about how do you go about doing sort of nation building or how you go about building peace or how you go about building resilience. What might you say to, to leaders who might be, or, or people who might be sitting out there and saying, you know, if these institutions are not broken, why, why should we change them? And, you know, how can we sort of push through that resistance definitely that will be there? Well, if the institutions aren't broken, uh, then we'd have a much better functioning world. That's all I'd say. Uh, so, so, okay. So now that doesn't mean the uh, you, the institutions have failed. Uh, is, let's face it. Like we, uh, you, you, you look at a lot of countries, and uh, yeah, they're in great. They're basically they're functioning fairly well. The problem is they're starting to. Uh, you've got a number of areas where they're uh, decaying. So look, a lot of the countries, let's say, particularly in the West, I'd say describe them not as in catastrophic failure, but having squeaky wheels. And I think these things can really be, really, really be fixed. So for me, the idea is not to do anything massively large first up. So one of the concepts with systems thinking is path dependency. So all 
cultures or countries, if you like, along a path. And that'll be determined by their cultural history. That'll be determined by their values. And that shapes where they're going into the future. And like if that's solid conflicts between two different groups, that shapes the path into the future. And we can see sometimes that these conflicts between groups can go on for centuries. Uh, so, so you've got and then you've got values. You've got the moral values, the cultural values, which are different in each society. So, this is the path of dependency. So, if you want to change it, you want to change it over time. And so, we believe in small nudges from many, many different directions to move it in the direction you want to go. With systems, they're a they're cycling. So what happens is that they're getting in a what we call a virtuous cycle where things are improving. They reinforce the other aspects in the system to keep it improving. So you end up with this reinforcing virtuous cycle. The opposite is, let's say, a, a vicious cycle. That can be expressed as a conflict trap, which is an expression everyone's heard of. So no, look, and you can look at sort of you've got resources, they get degraded, that leads to conflict. The conflict degrades the resources more, which leads to more conflict. So that's the opposite. Now, the way of being able to tackle this with governments is to be able to focus on small interventions, not large ones, small interventions. So you pick a manageable area, and now if it doesn't work, you've got the ability to adapt and adjust without making too much change. And so if you try and take a society and massively change it overnight, you're more likely to break it than fix it. And we've seen that in many, many examples of quite often good intentions gone wrong. Thank you, Steve and Rebecca, for that very insightful conversation. Steve talks about the need to take systemic perspectives to look at the various challenges we face today, not just as cause and effects, but as systems. How can you as a leader start to put this into practice? Well, to help set your thinking, we want to share with you an approach of design thinking that we use to help shape global solutions. We call it the three Ds. The three Ds of design thinking. It is a methodical approach so that you can take that first step towards a more systemic and inclusive way for problem solving. In today's complex world, we need to formulate holistic solutions that can address multifaceted challenges. Design thinking is useful in this sense and helps us think about problems through a process and address them with systemic perspectives. That is why at Consulus, we use this 3D design thinking method as an inclusive way to formulate solutions to problems. Here's how it works. The first step is dialogue. Dialogue, when done well, deepens our understanding of the hopes and concerns of the community. By listening with care and empathy with stakeholders, we can better sense the underlying issues that cause dysfunctional behaviors or suboptimal collaborations. The goal is not to get an agreement on viewpoints, but to learn from each other's perspectives why they think about issues in a certain way. The ability to initiate and have meaningful conversations among diverse stakeholders is a critical first step to discovering the cause that will then seed eventual solutions. Posture matters greatly. It is important to be adaptive, be willing to change, and constantly shift the posture of the conversation toward the needs of stakeholders. What matters most is to keep the conversation going to increase understanding and trust. The next step is divergent thinking, which is about shaping a safe space to allow different pathways to a solution. To do this, be clear about the objectives, set up the rules of engagement, and explain how you intend to develop their inputs for meaningful outcomes. That allows people to engage better by knowing how they can participate meaningfully. The key here is to allow the exploration of different pathways and not be afraid to evolve approaches midway if you noticed that some people have not been engaged. That is essential as a sign to diverse stakeholders that the process is inclusive and fair and that their presence and inputs matter to shape shared outcomes. The final step is to actualize the many thoughts and perspectives towards a probable solution, which is what we term dynamic creation. 
Design thinking works best when thoughts become realized through a tangible form, a prototype, that can be refined further after testing assumptions. The key is to be willing to define what it might look like as a solution without concluding too quickly. Some people might be overly cynical of change, resulting in no action taken at all towards change. So this process of dynamic creation helps to bring everyone on a journey toward a possible solution and remind everyone that it will always be a work in process. Start small. Begin with the basics to come up with an outline of the solution. It could be a new content outline for a program for inclusion or something more tangible like a new product that might require some tooling capabilities. The important thing is not to be afraid, but to start by defining a solution as a tangible way to bring people together and move one step forward in solution development and evolution. Do not be afraid to take a stab at prototyping and testing out the prototype. This could be the first of many leading to the ultimate one that everyone will finally land on. But at least the process has begun. Prototyping can happen in many forms. During the process, whenever you find that some people are feeling left out, create ways to involve them and let them know that they can still contribute. A better world calls for more leaders and organizations to have the courage to imagine and test out holistic yet creative solutions. Will you step up to the challenge? The three Ds of design thinking. They equip you with a structured method of looking at various issues and design solutions with a more holistic and inclusive approach. So 3D, dialogue, divergent thinking, and dynamic creation. Now, prototyping a solution is one thing. Being able to actualize collaborative efforts is a whole different ballgame. This requires very intentional trust and alliance building efforts. To give us a little perspective on this, let's watch this next conversation between Rebecca and Jim Moore. Jim is the founder, CEO, and president at Washington Institute for Business, Government, and Society, a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., dedicated to addressing global issues through business, government, and society. What did the Ukraine crisis tell us about why trust in it's important in institutions to drive change and common action. Um, we're actually airing this at a moment that I think uh, will go down in history as one of the most extraordinary times that we certainly in our lifetimes, if not longer, um, have ever experienced. Uh, the Ukraine crisis, uh, the invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine um, has really brought people together and in some ways has split people at the same time. Domestically here in the United States, for example, um, I've not heard for years where Republicans and Democrats have gotten along so well because they're very concerned by the threat that they've seen as a result of the invasion. Internationally, we began to see over these past couple of years a fragmentation of NATO, for example. The organization seemed to be, uh, uh, being, it was being fractured uh, particularly by President Trump, uh, the former president of the United States. And to have something like this happen has brought uh, institutions uh, together to be able to confront what a very serious situation is. And we, uh, for example, yesterday uh, learned on a totally different subject, but also a critically important subject, that we are at a tipping point. Uh, when it comes to climate change, and that came out from the United Nations. And so we're confronting an awful lot of very serious problems in our world today. And it is indeed institutions that are having to uh, really confront what the answer should be. Thank God institutions exist, but we should never forget the fact that institutions are only as strong as the members and the leadership of those institutions are concerned. And so uh, uh, one of the great uh, uh, unfortunate variables in what we're dealing with with Ukraine is the fact that we have in the past 48 hours seen here in the United States and throughout Europe and Asia uh, some of the most uh, vile uh, photos and video footage of people who are dead in the streets of uh, various cities uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, and then we're also confronted by the fact 
that the foreign minister um, of Russia and the military spokesman for the defense uh, ministry have come out and said that none of these bodies that we have seen uh, that are dead in the streets are actually dead bodies of Ukrainians, that they're all actors, that they've all been made up. And so the fact that we are dealing with people looking at the same things, but coming up with different facts, alternative facts, which I think is a complete non sequitur, facts are facts. Uh, we, can, we can have opinions about those facts, but uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, the fact that you have these conflicts that are going on and even within the institutions themselves. Do you think you there's anything else that institutional leaders or even professionals in, in these institutions, if you know you could speak directly to them, what else can they do in order to really rebuild the trust that people have in these institutions? And also what else could they do to perhaps enhance their capabilities for action and change? Well, I think one of the things that is so very important is transparency. I think true leadership allows for uh, a, a clear understanding of what the problem is and how it's being confronted. I think part of the problem that uh, the Trump administration had with the World Health Organization, for example, was that there did not seem to be transparency and that uh, coming up with certain conclusions as to where the coronavirus began um, and be wondering whether or not that there were some things that were happening, that were being hidden from people, uh, was becoming a real concern. And therefore, let's just get rid of the World Health Organization. I think that the true leadership allows for transparency and, uh, and trying to really address head on what the problem is. To somehow skirt around very difficult issues doesn't make for a very strong organization. And I think that there will be a continued need uh, for a lot of these issues that we're facing today uh, to be confronted um, head on. I mean, we, we've talked about several of these issues already. We've talked about the, the COVID-19 pandemic. We've talked about the invasion of Russia and Ukraine. We've talked about climate change. We're also dealing with tribalism. Uh, we're, we're dealing uh, today with, with people who are not able um, to sit in a room and to be able to really discuss things because there is immediate uh, concern before walking into that room that they are not going to agree, uh, they're, they're, they are going to dislike, they are going to distrust uh, everything that's going to be said in the room. And there needs to be a greater sensitivity uh, to listening. I think listening is absolutely key to the success of leaders. I think listening is key to the success of organizations, because without listening, we miss the boat. We miss the boat in terms of understanding what the problem is, how we got to that problem, and how we're going to resolve that problem. And so it's a very, it's a, it's a very uh, difficult um, situation to confront, but we've got to be able to listen to one another and have a certain amount of respect. Uh, don't dismiss from the, the very beginning. There is greater distrust today than there was 20 years ago, in which people aren't able to commune together and to really say, okay, I may disagree with this person, but I'm going to, I'm going to, the person has an incredible background, education, uh, decisions that were made, a uh, sense of ethics, et cetera. I just, I'm not gonna vote for you because I don't like the way you might do something three years from now when you're on the Supreme Court. And so it's very interesting to see this evolution that has really created the kind of tribalism that led here in Washington, D.C., where I'm sitting today, to all of a sudden show up on the steps of the U.S. Capitol on January 7th and to be able to destroy anything and everything because they didn't particularly like uh, what they believed was uh, a, a rigged election, which, which at the end of the day, it was not. But that didn't... Uh, that didn't stop an awful lot of people from uh, creating the kind of havoc that unfortunately led to deaths here in Washington, D.C., as well as injuries. And I think uh, a, a time uh, for us to be sitting back, taking a deep breath and saying, how did this ever, ever happen? 
I, I do have a little of a segue of a question here for you. Please. Um, and also understanding a little bit more on, you know, what the Washington Institute, you know, of business uh, society and governments actually, sorry, business governments and society um, huh? actually um, does. So you, your, your mission statement, you know, talks about bridging greater understanding between these different sort of um, agencies or institutions if we may could I, could you share a little bit more about how you know you in the Washington Institute actually you know builds trust within these different you know um, sort of stakeholders what are some of the things that you're doing in terms of building trust and building understanding well you know it's it's interesting but um, we were talking about all these massive problems that the world is facing today and certainly the United States, which has had a leadership position uh, for a very long time, is facing. Um, the fact is, is that we cannot here in the United States, and I don't think the world can deal with all of these problems just through government. I think that there is, there is a need to be able to bring together government, business, and society. And so the Washington Institute for Business, Government, Society was created um, as a result of recognizing that there's a need to be able to bring those three sectors together to be able to, to deal with all this. But I think that the first way to, to be able to deal with all this, there's got to be dialogue. There's got to be, again, listening, so that when you're making decisions, they're not rash decisions. They are based on uh, you know, um, information that is, that's valid, that's transparent, uh, in which if you don't understand exactly what's going on, probe it, dig into the weeds until you do understand it, and then proceed uh, accordingly. So what we're doing these days is we're involved in everything from cyberspace uh, and, and cybersecurity uh, to dealing with the climate change. We're working with Princeton University on a project, on, on a uh, project called Net Zero, which is trying to make sure that, uh, that the carbon footprints of of various countries around the world are absolutely minimized, if not totally eliminated as net zero uh, um, conveys. Uh, but we're also thinking about, um, you know, we have three priorities. One is technology and innovation. One is corporate social responsibility, and one is the global economy. So how will we know when institutions have rebuilt trust, rebuilt global trust, are able to, you know, become beacons of trust doing the job that they were so intended, or was built to, to do, right, to, to bring change, to um, sort of drive action um, for society, you know, so perhaps in some instances uh, for economy, uh, as you mentioned, the World Trade um, Organization, uh, what kind of change would we hope to see in the world, or can we hope to see in the world, and also, more specifically, what change do you think we could see um, with the conflict of Ukraine? Well, there's a lot there, but let me let me say first of all again that it's so important to recognize that these institutions that we have created are only as strong as the individuals who are making those institutions up, and I think we should never underestimate how we can go down the wrong road. Uh, the United Nations was created that we would never have war again. But look what we're going through right now. Um, we should always make sure that these institutions are, are, uh, are working towards the, the better angels of our nature, um, to use the words of Abraham Lincoln, uh, that we have got to be able to keep our leaders, the, the feet of our leaders to the fire, in making them responsive to the truth, to the facts, to what it is that we as a human family are trying to confront. It helps no one. And ultimately, for example, we know that the Russian people are not receiving the kinds of factual information that the rest of the world is receiving right now uh, because it is being um, prohibited from being shown on television. In fact, Wikipedia, which is uh, uh, you know an extraordinary tool that all of us use uh, on the internet, uh, was told that they would have to be they would be fined fifty thousand dollars if they did not refrain from using the word invasion. That they needed to use the word military special military operation. Well, you know, trying to put together fancy words to be able to somehow camouflage 
the reality of what the situation is will ultimately a, not help them, but ultimately, too, at the end of the day, um, you know, Russia will will not be the better for it. Let me let me give you let me give, if I may, um, an interesting anecdote towards that end. Um, I was the chief negotiator for the United States in what turned out to be the last trade and economic agreement with the Soviet Union. We didn't know at the time that it was going to be the last trade and economic agreement with the Soviet Union, but it was. And so we were in the process of putting all this together. Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States at the time. And there was a real question as to that, what, what to do in putting together this agreement. Well, it so happened that for the Soviet Union, it was on its back. It had, had a very uh, bad uh, wheat season. And so they were having problems being able to uh, feed their people. There were a lot of problems in terms of a central command economy that had been built uh, over many decades. And so there were those in the United States who, uh, in the administration, who were all for, let's just let them figure it out. We're getting to the end of the Cold War. We shouldn't do anything to help them out. Let them figure it out themselves. There were a number of us. And fortunately, later on, as I would find out, President Reagan was very much in favor of, we've got to engage them. We've got to be able to bring uh, them into the global marketplace. This is a country that spans 11 times up. And we need to be able to see ways that we can uh, be able to, uh, to, to be able to bring trust and to give them a sense of welcoming into the global marketplace. So I came up with an idea which was to be able to put together 15 different groups in which we would be able to have that would be divided in industry sectors, things like basic industries and consumer goods and technology, and have our executives get together with their executives and they could be able to show them how accounting works, how legal mechanisms work, how the West and how the rest of the world actually uh, are able to make business flow and be able to raise the standard of living for their people. And so I had to appear at the time Colin Powell was, who would become our Secretary of State, was the head of the National Security Council. And so I had to make an appearance where I would lay out exactly how to be able to do all this and how we should put this together, knowing that there would be people in that room who would be very much against being able to help the Soviet Union out at all. Well, fortunately, after making the presentation, it all worked. President Reagan made abundantly clear that he was in favor of engaging the Soviet Union. And so I flew with a team of 40 people to Moscow to be able to ultimately negotiate an agreement that really kept in mind the fact that all boats uh, rise and fall together, not one over the other. And so let's bring the Soviet Union into play and do what we can to be able to make them a success. And so that makes things today, of course, a lot more bittersweet given what has evolved. But nonetheless, that was the right way, I think, for us to proceed. And I'm very proud that we did it that way. Thank you, Jim and Rebecca. Thank you for that conversation on the need to bring people together through building trust and be able to create platforms for substantive dialogues to appreciate each other's interests. Next, we want to share with you an alliance building method that you can practice in your own efforts to shape change in your institutions and your organizations. In our increasingly divisive world, one of the most essential skills is knowing how to build alliances to bring about change. In building alliances, what is most critical is not having everyone like each other, but enabling people to see the mutual benefits of being part of the team and sharing a common vision to shape change. Here's a framework you can use. Trust is a method we use at Consulus to build alliances for change. T stands for trust level. R stands for relational confidence. U stands for unifying grounds. S stands for synergy of purpose. Finally, T stands for taking that leap of faith. The first step is to assess the level of trust among prospective Alliance members, and this applies to any environment or community. From our research, there are essentially three levels of trust. At the basic level is transactional trust. When trust is transactional, people are focused on tasks and benefits at a very functional level and what's in it for them. 
there is little desire for greater collaboration to shape change, and any new initiatives can be seen as not worth it, so you will need to do more to raise the level of trust. The second level is transformational trust. When trust is transformational, people are open to new possibilities and exchanges. There is a greater desire for collaboration now, though people are unsure on how to align their actions to shape change. The third and highest level of trust is transfigurative trust. When trust is transfigurative, people have confidence both in the purpose of the alliance and trust the capabilities of each other to realize the vision or change. So ask yourself, what's the level of trust in your possible alliance? Is it transactional, transformative, or transfigurative? The next step is to build relational confidence. Relational confidence is about how people connect with your leadership. How well can people relate to your narrative and the vision you paint? Ultimately, do they have faith in you and the people you have gathered to impact change? The third step is to find unifying grounds to cluster shared interests. It is difficult to get everyone to like every person in the room, but it is certainly possible to find that some people will connect easier within a smaller group first. Think of it as gathering small tribes together. Within each of these tribes, there are already shared interests. So how do you invite others to find their place within these small tribes first while remaining open to uniting under one tent? By doing so, the movement can grow. Being able to attract tribes before gathering them under a shared tent of purpose matters. Which brings us to the next point about synergy of purpose. The best way to secure commitment to action is to have a sense of the aspirations of tribes and to discover a way to achieve synergy through an overarching purpose. What matters here is not a complete match of the purpose to their own, but the ability to see that there is synergy and can add value to their tribe or personal purpose. Only then can you begin to orient the entire movement towards common action. Finally, the proof of the power of your alliance is the ability to mobilize them to take a leap of faith together for change. Start with something achievable to build confidence, then take that big leap of faith towards shaping change. There are complex challenges confronting us, but by building alliances through trust, may it help you shape a better world. Indeed, being able to build an alliance for change is critical, and we hope that you will find this method useful but also give it a try. <laughs> to summarize what we have learned in this worldview, there is a need for systemic problem solving. And this can only begin if we are willing to change our frame of mind. Inclusive dialogue is critical to be able to get holistic perspectives, as well as to build understanding and trust. There is a need to build trust and alliances for change to be actualized. We also shared with you two tools to help address these issues and challenges. The three Ds, a systemic design thinking method for problem exploration and solution development, trust method, which is made the five steps towards building an alliance for change. We hope that with the perspectives and insights you have gained today, equipped with these tools, you can take that first step in being a change agent, in shaping a better economy by design.